Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having uh, a great day. I hope that you had a great week, week to this point. Um, I wish all of you the best. Uh, before I get started on this, I want to remind everybody that we are pushing and challenging everyone to support the work we're doing at the Odyssey Project. Uh, whether it's Black Man Lead, whether it's a program for domestic violence uh, victims, uh, violence of childhood sexual abuse, uh, mental health. Uh, the big program uh, with the most challenges is Black Man Lead, a rite of passage initiative uh, that's designed to help socialize young black boys, but also on the back end to help resource young black males that may be struggling to adapt uh, to a world around them. Uh, it is so important that we deal with this. Uh, there is far too much unnecessary and senseless violence uh, that can be mitigated. And I am challenging everyone to show some love, show some support, click the button. Uh, the link in the box, or if you want to give through the organization's cash app account, that information is in there as well. Uh, recently, I received a request um, and I get these, but recently I received a request to do an interview. And it, it, it's unique in the sense that it's surrounding one specific book that is kind of dated. Uh, but it is probably one of my most distributed books, and it's The Miseducation of Black Youth in America. There are several actual universities who use it as part of course study. Uh, the book has done pretty well in that area, and uh, you know I'm proud of that. Uh, and so they wanted to interview me about the miseducation of black youth in America. Now, and uh, I requested more information on, you know, what, you know, specifically the platform is about, you know, what's going on, uh, how they came back. So we're in the process of getting that done and everything checks out. We'll definitely do the interview. I have no problem doing interviews. Um, and uh, I, I just want people to really understand where my heart, at, where my heart is at and where my work is at. What makes that interesting isn't the fact that I got contact, it's that during uh, this time, I've been over the last couple of weeks just really revisiting uh, another one of my books, which is my 19th book. The Miseducation of Black Youth in America is my 16th book. Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery is my 19th book and to that point the most comprehensive visitation uh, of the enigmatic and problematic issues we face on an ongoing basis as a collective and I am going to sort of start sharing with you some of the things that pop out to me when I go back and I look at that and I'm going man I remember this everything is not just simply a representation or a presentation of facts and ideas and theories and concepts. It's also a logging of my progression as I'm discovering as well. And so what you have to understand with a book that comes from research, you're probably reading something that was birthed in origin five, six, seven, eight, ten years ago. So when you look back and you're talking about the miseducation of black youth, you're taking that back into the 1990s. Um, now, I've written on the topic many times before the book, but the book goes back to the original discovery. Born in Captivity is a visitation of all of the things conglomerately from the, our failure to practice group, uh, group economics to the miseducation of our youth to the destruction of the black family to the targeting of the black man, to the failure to protect the black woman. Uh, there's so many things. And the thing that really popped out of me initially, and so I decided I would start with talking about it there, was a chapter called The Identity Crisis. And anybody that understands sociology, psychology, human behavior, human performance, you understand that people perform based off how they see themselves in the world. Well, in order to subjugate a people uh, especially in large numbers over a long period of time, it requires more than shackles because at some point you have to release them uh, to allow them to do certain things and you have to allow the movement. But what, what we find in the study of history 
is that when you can shackle the mind, you don't need to shackle the body. We can understand that slavery extended the, as far as it did because those who sought freedom and were willing to fight for it were often turned over and given up by those who were still shackled by the mind and, and no longer desired the freedom that those who were willing to run and fight and kill uh, did. You know, uh, for every Nat Turner, there were 500 uh, people who were going to sell him out. And that's because of the shackling of the mind. So when you start talking about identity crisis, you have to understand that where we are right now is a play out of 400 years, 246 years of chattel slavery and another 157 years of uh, slavery by another name. Uh, and what we have to really understand in approaching that is the devastation of a stolen or replaced or diminished identity. I can't go into it as in a depth as I want to, but I want to start visiting because I want to start talking about why we're where we are. And that's what Born in Captivity Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery did. It spoke to a behavior that's inexplicable. You always saying, man, what the hell was you thinking? Why do we keep doing this? What's going on? Well, it's an explanation for that. We can't sit up and have 246 years of chattel slavery play out and then believe that we just simply are told we can go. And then we walk out and everything is okay. You have to ask yourself, okay, with the traumatization, uh, with the trauma traumatization of black people over the course of 246 years where you have your spirituality disrupted you have your family structure disrupted you have your values your interests and your principles uh, your VIPs the things that govern your character your your established hopes, values, your projection into the future for your progeny all comes from your values, your interests, and your principles. You have those taken away. You have them superimposed by the values, interests, and principles of an opposing force, someone that is going to benefit from your demise, someone that's going to benefit from your oppression, someone that's going to benefit from being able to keep you at bay. Now, these people know who you are, and that's why that's so important for them to superimpose a new identity, the identity of the slave. You see, the, the identity of the slave is to ensure that you understand the relationship. The relationship is that of the master and of the slave. And they superimposed and reinforced it with religion because they understood, our, uh, they, they understood our spirituality and our respect for a higher power. So they introduced us to their version of a higher power and then superimposed the will of that higher power over us and gave us a respect for it. Now, here's the problem with that. When you rob someone of their identity, they no longer who, know who they are. They start to seek an explanation. They start to seek someone who can tell them. That's why it's so important for us to properly socialize our children. Why? Because when we don't give them their identity, when we don't establish a solid, valuable, workable, explosive self-value within their self-image, they'll look for it elsewhere. They'll look for some form of validation. They'll try. And when you're asking your kid to go out into a world that's predominantly flow, uh, enforced and empowered through a white racial class racial caste system to go out and find their identity and find confidence in who they are you, you, you're creating a pretty pretty tall task you're asking them to do something beyond reason here's why because this system is designed to present everything Eurocentric as the standard. So the beauty standard is Eurocentric. It's the Eurocentric idea of what's beautiful, the Eurocentric idea of what's classy, the Eurocentric idea of what's professional. And then watch what happens. The same thing that happened in slavery happens now. What happens is white people define the standard. Black people literally uh, champion the standard and insist that all black peoples uh, people abide by stuff. You need to be more professional. You need to shave. You need to cut your hair shorter. You need to do this. Oh, you're not gonna be able to wear those braids. You're not. You need to start. You and and well, you know you should. You you got to get it. And, and and the whole idea is you start to aspire to be something you're not. 
so that you can be accepted, so that you can fit in, so that you're not looked at as the slave. That identity crisis that we suffer with, we're still suffering from it. We haven't healed. Where in time is there anywhere in history that it shows that after slaves were released, that was this ongoing process of allowing them to have intervention and treatment for the trauma they went through. There was never a healing process. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, we have to sit up and say, actually what we did is we, we experienced re-injury. Traumatic re-injury is when you've already been traumatized and you go through a traumatic experience again. We, that's traumatic re-injury at a level that we can now define it as complex trauma. What is complex trauma? Complex trauma is a far more complicated facet of traumatization that extends beyond PTSD. PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. It is an event that you experience, something that you go through. It could be a, uh, going through a sickness. It can go be an accident. It could be combat. It, it, but it's normally an experience, even if it's a conglomerate experience that happens over time it's normally one experience and so you have this experience that's PTSD you come back home from a, a six month nine more nine month tour you need to be treated for PTSD there's just too much you see there's a too much that goes on the the, the the mind can't process it the emotions get jarred the body literally takes a record of it you're literally keeping a score of your trauma inside every cell of your body and that is actually what starts the triggering of, of, of traumatic tra traumatic memory or implicit memory or a bunch of other things that go along with it. I don't want to get too much into that. But what I want to talk about is there has to be an intervention. There has to be something. Complex trauma is the stacking of trauma. You go through one traumatic event. It's, we're not done. Another traumatic event. And so we haven't just individually gone through complex trauma. We have collectively gone through complex trauma. Okay, let me explain. We go through 246 years of chattel slavery. Now, you got to understand there are a bunch of traumatic events that happen individually to slaves that other slaves experience. You don't have to be the victim of an assault to be traumatized by the assault. There are people still being treated right now for watching what they saw on 9-11 in 2001. Right now. I keep up with this stuff. There are little people that are still being treated. Uh, you can be traumatized by observing something, by being aware of something, by simply hearing about it. So it depends on where your emotional stability is, where your emotional threshold is, uh, where your norms and standards lie, so many other things that you, you, you have to take into consideration, but you can be traumatized uh, by things that don't directly impact you. Okay, but all... So we, we're talking about slavery, but we're talking about all the things that happen in slavery on an individual level, on a plantational level, and all this other stuff. But we're going to call it one experience, just to keep it simple, to show you how, how devastating this is. So, but it's complex, and, and I'm going to show you how we build on it. So that's one experience. That's one trauma, slavery, 246 years. It's really multiple traumas, but we're going to call it one trauma. So you're free now, but damn, here comes... Uh, reconstruction. What is reconstruction? They'll try to paint reconstruction as this glorious time where things started to get better. No. Actually, what reconstruction was was the 12 years following the Civil War in the South where clandestine groups like the Klan and other clandestine groups raided military, uh, Northern Union military installations, burned them, shot at people, and it was extremely costly and dangerous. And so the North literally pulled out of the South, leaving slaves here. And slaves had limited places they can go because no one wanted us. So we had millions of <laughs> slaves that literally were in the South and didn't have anywhere to go. There were certain places people were fleeing, but it was overcrowded. And so we were literally stuck here. Okay, so now the Reconstruction was actually the reestablishing of the antebellum South with everything except the title slave. And here's how it is. The first thing they did after Reconstruction and running everyone out and reestablishing white power in the South, they came up with black codes. Trauma number three. Black codes were saying that there are just certain jobs blacks were not going to allow be allowed to have certain businesses blacks were not going to be allowed to run so blacks could not get jobs in the areas in which they were experts why was the black why were the black clothes so important who had been doing all the labor who had been doing all the skilled work who had been doing all of these things all these years up until this point blacks we were the most skilled we would get the jobs we would be the ones working we would have an advantage they stopped that again that's that's on that side so then what 
okay, after black codes, what convict leasing? What's convict leasing? Convict leasing is this real unique little spin on the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment, which uh, uh, frees, uh, was the establishment of the constitutional uh, amendment that freed slaves, but it also gave a specific exception in the instance of incarceration, the rights of a citizen is uh, suspended. And in that instance, they can be held without their will and they can have they can be used for labor. Uh, since then, it has been altered. And, you know, if 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 a, if a prisoner works, a prisoner has to be compensated, but it's pennies on the dollar. Uh, and it's not always in cash in the state of Texas. It's, it's, it's uh, compensating what's known as good time for every day that you do and you do your job, you get uh, a credit for a day. And so you can literally do half of your time and your good time will free you. Uh, but then they take it back. So you still end up on parole. Oh, it, it gets real good. I mean, the, the system is unbelievable. But anyway, okay, so convict leasing was a, a time when they criminalized activity that was coming among blacks like vagrancy. Well, I don't have a job and I don't have a home. I'm a vagrant. Well, vagrancy became a felony. And so then it could be punishable up to... Uh, 12 years so you, you you're now a prisoner for 12 years and guess what happened we they were leased back these these freed slaves were leased back to the very plantations they had been freed from uh the plantation owners paid the state pennies on the dollar the convict got nothing so again working for free to enrich white people not done yet we had redlining we had urban re renewal we had benign neglect we had 70 plus years of Jim Crow segregation uh, we had uh, gentrification we've, we've had mass incarceration we've had miseducation miseducation was a big thing why because we can't empower you now we'll prepare you to work for us but we're never going to empower you you're never going to really get a holistic education no we'll give you what you need to learn how to read and write to study to follow rules to be trained so that you can work for us we don't want to give you too much power we don't want to teach you things then that came the deindustrialization of the inner city which really hit hard in the black family why the black man even without a college degree had a means by which he could actually work and take care of his family as a sole provider. And this was all the way up until the 60s, moving close to the 70s. How was this done? Uh, plants, uh, manufacturing plants, uh, warehouses and things of that nature. Uh, Detroit was huge for it. There were different places down, like my grandfather moved to Houston so that he could learn welding and go build all rigs on the ship channel. We literally live walking distance from the ship channel. That's where my grandfather earned a living and took care of the family. Now, my grandmother had her own business, but that's what my grandfather did. He had a second grade education, but he made a living better than a lot of white men being a welder and working for that. And so what happened is they deindustrialized. They moved all the plants, most of the plants that could. A lot of plants still on the ship channel. Ship channel. You can also be a longshoreman on ship channel. You can load ships and do everything. It's a bunch of things. The, the people in our neighborhood, you know, they were the last of that breed where men with no education, black men with no education, was still able to work with their hands and provide for their families. Well, they deindustrialized. They moved that. The plants uh, in Detroit, the plants in uh, Chicago, the plants in uh, so many plants in Houston. I could tell you that places that had warehouses, 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 you go now and the warehouses are turned, torn down and condominiums are built up. What happened? They moved them overseas. They moved them different places. What happened? Now we can't. Another thing they did at the same time they de deindustrializing it, they took free training out of schools. You used to be able to take wood shop, mecha auto mechanics, uh, electric, uh, you know, uh, being an electrician. Um, what's another one? Plumbing. You just be take take these type of things in school, meaning you would literally graduate with a workable skill that you can earn a living with. They took it out. Now you're gonna have to go get in debt and go to some uh, school that teaches the trade. A trade school is what they call it. But all of these things are happening. These are what we call uh, stacked experiences of trauma. We're being traumatized. We're being constantly pushed through a grinder where we are being handled in ways that are catastrophic and devastating to us psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually, and in, in many instances, physically. How many times have we seen uh, snuff videos of cops shooting unarmed black men? Sometimes handcuffed. One of the most devastating things I've ever seen, and I've never recovered for it, and it had put it put me on a collision course with what, a lot of what I do now. 2009, Oscar Grant, 
handcuff Fruitville Station. And 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 the thing is, if you've ever been to the Bay Area, you've ever been there and been around and been around people and moved around, you, you you've heard of Fruitville. You you know about it. And to watch that cop shoot him in the back with his handcuffs and he's prone on his stomach. That was the first beginning. It's the first time I've ever saw it happen in a video. You hear about it happen. You heard about Amadou Duallo. Uh, there's a cop named Scott Sherhart shot a, a security guard, a black security guard, multiple times uh, here in Houston. Got fired and got a job somewhere else. But you hear about it. You don't actually see it. When they, you start seeing it, you don't think that's trauma, to, trauma. You don't think that's messing with us. And that's this collective experience that we're going through, that we're connected to. You ever notice? And, you know, it's different now. But for those of you who grew up in my time, maybe 15 years behind me, you ever notice that when the news came on, or if you go around your elders now and you get to talking about something and somebody gets to talking about something that happened and you get you see that trouble look on their face what that trouble look is they are wondering if the person you're talking about is black they are literally hoping my grandmother would say lord please don't let this man be black the news come on and talk about somebody robbed somebody shot somebody stole something did something and why because there's this natural connectivity where we carry the guilt of the poor behavior of the people and that's because that is can be traced all the way back to slavery again we have lost our identity and a part of what is going to be necessary for us to truly heal and for us to truly be empowered. We can talk all the mechanisms and strategies. We've got some brilliant minds. We've got Dr. Claude Anderson. We got Umar Johnson. We've got Dr. Hon John Harry Clark back in the day. We we had Dr. Amos Wilson. Uh, oh my God, Dr. Naima Bar. Today we've got Joy DeGraw, Dr. Joy DeGraw. We've got. Uh, Dr. Howard Stevenson, we've got Dr. Fully Love, we've got a bunch of them. I've put in volume after volume myself. I've, I'm on book number 25. And what I can tell you, we can talk all those strategies, we can talk, but if we don't deal with our identity crisis, we can never operate and move and do the things that are necessary for us to be who we need to be in this world. How we see ourselves in the world has a massive impact on what we're willing to do for ourselves, what we believe we can do for ourselves. There's a reason why we keep asking them to fix our problems, because we've been conditioned to believe that they have the power and we don't. And until we can sit up and we can develop that and build it, that's why socializing young black males are so important. That's why socializing young black females are so important. We have to get out of aspiring to be them, to be like them, to be accepted by them. We need to start basking in the beauty and the power of who we are. Our history, our heritage, it didn't start in 20, it didn't start in uh, 1619. It's rich in history for thousands of years. And we have to be willing and ready to put in the work, to put in the time. Uh, again, you know, this book, man, it represents, as you can see, it's not, it's close, it's 400 pages, 421 pages. Uh, there's only one other book that has more, and that's The Undoing of the African American Mind. That was book number 23. But this book, man, it is... It just, and I can't, and I'm going through it and I'm just eating up again, you know. And I do, I read my own books. I do. Um, it, 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 it's, it's cathartic. It builds confidence because you get to see who you are. You know, as a an avid reader, I've developed an appreciation for good writing. And when you look at stuff and say, man, I wrote that. Man, my, where was I at in that zone? It's like uh, a, a, a rapper who writes a lyric and go back and go, man, dude, what was he smoking when he wrote that? That get that feeling. But what I'm telling you now is, as I go back through it and I revisit it, I'm excited because I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the possibilities. But we've got work to do. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to get in. I'm going to actually sit down in here and do a little work in the cigar shop. But we've got a lot of work to do as a collective again i'm going to challenge you to show some work i mean show some love show some support for the work we do in the community uh research costs 
program development costs, program execution and sustaining and operations costs. We are dealing with situations where it's not just, okay, you know, advocating in school districts. I do that. I have advocated in multiple school districts across the country, uh, especially when it comes to dealing with special education, when it comes to uh, uh, highly uh, excessive discipline and a bunch of other things. I've been that person uh, that has gone to bat for my people in, against school districts, and I will continue to do so. But again, that costs. If you have a child that's not been, and I do it at the collegiate level, I've gone to bat for people at the collegiate level. Um, different ball game, whole different type of situation, but we need representation in all of these areas. We don't realize just how the deck, decks are stacked. We don't realize how our children are being targeted. And we need to be around people who can explain it to us. We need to be around people who can show us what to do. We need to be around people who can write out blueprints of how to move in this. This is not something you're just going to sit up and talk about and wish it. And it's going to happen because we're supposed to be. No, we're going to have to claim it. We're going to have to possess it. We're going to have to literally walk into it. And it's not going to be easy because there's a constant force. It's not what they did 150 years. It's that they did it and then they followed it up with one thing after another to reinforce it. They're constantly reinforcing messages and if you're not careful, you won't even get it. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Uh, thank you for allowing me to have your time. I didn't even expect to go this long, but I guess when you get to talking about that and I start going through, you don't understand the amount of research it takes to write a book like this. This isn't, hey, front yard, backyard stuff. This is literally an answer to an enigma while explaining the enigma. I thank God for the blessing that I have to be able to do what I do and the natural passion to it, to want to do it. This goes back to school. I mean, high school. It's, it's something. But I want to leave this world with more than just what I've written. And that's why I work so hard in the community. That's why I'm so hands-on because I want to touch lives. We've got a lot of work to do. I'm going to challenge you. Help me get as much of this as done as I can. Show some love, show some support. And stay tuned because I'm going to be coming back and we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff in this book. This book alone could get us probably a year. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to take it that long, but I'm definitely going to visit some things and we're going to really discuss what's out there. Uh, and why we need to be more aware and why we need to be more prepared. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an un...